stages behind the scenes. I am your behind the scenes host, Jordan Burke, with your behind the scenes host, Kristen Priola. And uh, just some really quick stuff before we start the show. You may be wondering, hey, Saints and Sages podcast, where the heck did your Instagram account go? And I will reply to you, we deleted it. Oh. <laughs> Here's why. If you want to follow us, we're trying to consolidate and better serve everybody. And so what we're going to do is uh, all Saints and Sages posts along with Firelight posts, because we had two things are going to be on um, Instagram at spiritual Catholic Spiritual Direction, I believe is the um, code, tag, whatever. So that's out of the way. Catholic Spiritual Direction. Sorry, I know we've made that really confusing because <laughs> we've changed it like six <laughs> times. It will not change again. We're not changing it anymore. And if you have a question, you can email us at saintspod at myavola.com. Also, Firelight. We're actually going to be doing a really huge push for Firelight here in the next, uh, pro, you, actually today. That's but, today. Oh, yeah. yeah we're going to be doing a push <laughs> for it over the next week or so mm -hmm. where we really want people to join in with us. We're super passionate. Kristen is the level of passion that she has for serving young folks on a scale of one to 12 is probably about a 376.2. <laughs> so glory to God. Deo gracias. In order to do that, we need, we want to bring in more young folks and or, and when I say young folks, what do I mean, 18 to 35, basically young professionals is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 18 to 35, uh, who want to dive deeper in the faith, who want to understand the faith, who want to join in with other young Catholics who are equally as, on fire eager to serve eager. Our word. thank you yes mm -hmm. um because we all know like there's so many different groups out there so many different communities that just don't serve in the way that we are blessed to be able to serve at firelight and hoping to even and more hoping so. to yeah so if you want to join firelight a p o s t o l i v i a e dot org apostle v a dot org join create a profile join firelight and you'll interact with us uh, we have a meeting every other Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central to 8 p.m. Central. We're studying a bunch of different books. It's it's a lot of fun. The community, we have like a tight-knit family right now going on. It feels like on. it. All it's, over the world, though, like which yeah. is so cool. And even better, what we're going to have now, we're going to start implementing. So if you're already in Firelight, you're going to love to hear this. We're going to implement Fireside Chats. Do you want to tell them about that? I guess I will a little bit. So Andres, <laughs> our friend, was like, oh, yes, yeah, so our Fireside Chats. And we're like, oh, that's actually really cool. I think that was like Theodore Roosevelt or something. They're like Fireside Chats on, on the radio whatever whatever you all know history better than i do but anyway we were super excited because we love to just get to know everybody and just share and um i don't know exactly jordan i yeah, wasn't so, prepped for that but no i'm yeah, sorry just... i sprung it on you essentially it's not <laughs> just thought. a book study so we're going to do the book study but maybe once a month maybe twice a month. we got to figure it out maybe once a month right now is probably the base we're just going to get together and say what's going on in your life like we want to get to know you guys yeah, like, and build relationships correct. that are long lasting and eternal. Right? It's one thing like, to have people show at. up to a book study and that's really good. And there's a lot of good that comes from that. We want to learn and educate ourselves. We do, but, but we also want to know the people who are there, like truly know them. So we're really excited about it. All that out of the way. <laughs> you ready to start the show? Saint Therese, pray for us. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> it's been a morning y'all it has been absolutely a morning <laughs> but okay. we are very excited to to talk about yeah. my favorite patron saint you ready yes hey i'm jordan burke and i'm Kristen priola and this is saints and sages where we talk about the wisdom of the saints and how it's relevant for you and usually i'm the one who says i'm super excited <laughs> today we're gonna switch that role Kristen. <laughs> I'm outlandishly excited, Ooh, good right? Word. Extraordinarily excited because I love St. Therese. <laughs> She's my favorite. <laughs> She's been so kind to me. So we're going to be talking about St. Marie Francoise Therese Martin, but she has her um, Carmelite name as well. And I don't have it on this paper and I'm like really bummed that I'll have it. Here it is. Arlie, uh, she claimed the Holy Child. Um, Jordan, what is it? Where did it go? So I'm Kristen has, uh, has, if I'm going to look at her, you know, we used it's to joke obnoxious. about her pack of notes. <laughs> she has actually literally seven pages of notes in front of her right I now. So forgive it. her. <laughs> Basically, it was, it was St. Therese of Lusso, of the I, which I can't Saint say Therese well. St. Therese of Lusso. I don't speak French. Jesus. Of the child Jesus and the, the holy, holy face, face right? Was that it? it? I think mm -hmm. that was it. Incredibly long. Could you imagine signing that every day? <laughs> so let's go ahead and dive in and talk about this amazing saint and even more so so 
actually, I, I'm not trying to jump ahead, but she is a doctor of the church, and there's a reason we're going to get into that. Mm. Her understanding of spirituality and faith and relationship with Jesus in humility, in the little way, in suffering is incredibly profound, especially when you take into account that she died at the age of 24. So I know I, I'm, I'm laying this foundational groundwork here. Can you fill us in on <laughs> some information, like a little little background, or do you want to just go into it? Well, Jordan, there are many experts on this beautiful doctor of the church. Um, she was declared doctor in 1997 by St. Pope John Paul II. And so there's a lot of wisdom and teaching out there in just the short amount of time that she lived on this earth. And it just like exploded back in her time. So maybe we could give just the outline, yeah. like the foundational facts of who she is. Yeah. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, St. Therese was born in Alencon, France, near Normandy in 1873. But her family moved to Lisieux. Um, there were nine children. Only five of the children survived. And all five were girls. And Therese is the youngest. So this is a really big deal for Therese. Just because I don't know about y'all. But I'm the youngest child. And there's something about being the youngest child. <laughs> where you get a lot more attention sometimes. Or if you don't. Maybe you're a little bit spoiled. But the family just knows you're the youngest child. Youngest child syndrome is a thing. So she kind of had that a little bit. I was the oldest. So they just threw me to a pack of wolves. <laughs> and let me be. So Learned it. I, I can't. Yeah. I can't relate. But continue. Yes. Her dad even called her like little queen. And so in the family, it was just kind of a thing of like, oh, St. Therese, like, or not St. Therese, oh, Therese. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, but she had extremely devout parents and this set her up for success. The faithfulness, faithfulness of St. Zelie and St. Louis Martin really is just how she had that security and love from, a, from the start to have a, an incredible relationship with our Lord. And so anyway, St. Therese, actually, okay, so her mother died at age four of cancer, and that was a really big turning point mm -hmm. for her. And then her sister, Pauline, who became like a mother to her, left to join the Carmelite convent. So her, her family, at a young age, her family was already starting to have this tumultuous kind of experience with both the siblings dying and then her mother passing. And it's, it's worth noting that she was even going through this um, this process of high emotion, you know, it's written that she would stomp her feet at everything. And what I love when I read was that she said, she said she would cry and then she would cry Crying because she cried. Right. <laughs> so that gives you kind of an insight into her emotional state, how she kind of operated on the day to day basis. Like Kristen said, her dad called her my little queen and he worked really hard to give her everything. She'd like never leave her in want. I totally understand that. I have I have a little girl. I call her my little bear, which is a little bit different because <laughs> I want her to be fierce and strong. But also, you know, she is a little queen. Um, so I understand that. But uh, yeah, it's just interesting. So and I, I want to note that because that's going to play into a huge aspect of who she later becomes while she's well, there's a transformation at Christmas, which we'll get to. But then her who she becomes in Carmel, right? That's that's really where the meat of this entire thing is. So I just wanted to note that really quick. Absolutely. And like we said, there's so many directions we could go with the, her story because there's so much to her. Yeah. But we're going to try our best to just share just some bits and pieces. So definitely do your own research and please like do your own research as, and learn as, about as, St. Therese. As we say life. with all of the saints Read we talk about. Read her autobiography. Yeah. yeah. Like go go there yourself. Yeah. We are not the experts but, by any means. Um, and so, but she had a period of inner turmoil because she had a constant fear of sinning and when her mother passed away i mean she really turned to the virgin mary for comfort mm -hmm. at age two two years old she was ready she's like i want to go to i want to be a nun like my sisters so clarifying her her mom passed at four but at, four. at two at, at, at age, age two. two excuse me that's when she was like i want to be a nun yeah which is super young and so she like you said she would cry because she was crying and she was a really beautiful talented young girl but also you know people were a little bit jealous of her at school and so her father agreed for Therese to return home um 
and be taught by her elder sister Celine when she was little because they there was a lot going on at school and she was actually unhappy. So she ended up experiencing a painful illness called scruples and often had like nervous tremors. And in that experience, she suffered from delusions. And this mm. was a young age, but her health and her mental state returned to normal. And then she had a conversion of heart to pray. Um, for the souls of others and for sinners. And this was a, one of the turning points in her life, but she received the singular grace of being healed from this serious illness through the intercession of Our Lady of Victories. And she claimed that the Holy Child had healed her and she decided to call Mary Our Lady of Smiles. Smiles, yep. Which I just love. I like yep. super relate with her on which that Which also one. plays into her, her, how she lived her life later on mm -hmm. with the smiles, which is also very important to note. So she really thought of herself as the new St. Joan of Arc. Like yeah. she really admires St. Joan of Arc. And you can see pictures online. If you go online, you can see pictures of her dressed up as St. Joan of Arc. And there's a whole story there. I don't know if we have the time to go into it, but look that up because it's really, really cute. It's really <laughs> quite amazing. I know we've talked about it a few times. Blessed Pierre Giorgio, you know, you, we have pictures of him. And the joke about Blessed Pierre is he's the only saint that we have in a bathing suit, right? A picture of him <laughs> in a bathing suit. suit. Swimsuit, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's it was so neat for me to see these pictures of St. Therese dressed as saint joan of arc like we have that we we can we can see this piece of history of this the life of the saint it's totally worth looking up it's, it's pretty amazing yes and it was 1873 that's when she was born and she died in what was it jordan 19 just to add 24 oh, years i don't know what's 24 the, years the listeners can do the math 1897 I'm not but we'll get there. So at nine years old, she when she was first to join the convent, she was too young. Or wanted to join the convent, she was too young. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. She really understood, though, at a young age, that her glory would be hidden from the eyes of others until God wished to reveal it. Which is a really profound. At nine. Yeah, it's really <laughs> profound. It's it. This is it, this is I think personally the beginning of her journey into this humility, into this little way. Right. Because she's written like she wanted everything. And that's reflected in not just her writings, but things that are her her personal writings. I mean, but things that were written about her where later on she talks about struggling with what would you say? She wanted to be a priest and a, and a and missionary. A missionary. Mm -hmm. And she was struggling with that. And this seems to be where in her life she's saying, OK, I get it. My what I want for my glory or whatever that is, whatever God chooses that to be, will not be revealed until God says it's going to be revealed. That is a total and complete step back, step away from who you are and out of yourself and your desires to give that to Christ. And I think this is for me, again, looking at just her timeline in our study, this is the beginning of that, that pure humility that she exudes so well later on in, in her life. Yes, because she started off a little bit spoiled as the yeah. youngest child. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but her parents really wanted her to be virtuous and they strived to, and we could have a whole nother episode on St. Zelie and Louis Martin, yeah. but they strive to protect her. And, you know, as a little girl, it can be, um, exciting to do things that your parents don't want you to do and one of which was like reading the newspaper when her when her dad was trying to preserve his his daughters and they would secretly take it you know that kind of stuff yeah. um but when she was 14 after midnight mass christmas in 1886 she had a lot of self-doubt and depression and uncertainty like we mentioned these self delusions but it suddenly lifted from saint tres and this left her in possession of a new common inner conviction. And this was the conversion that changed her life. And for her, Christmas Eve was not about Santa Claus or Father Christmas, but from the child Jesus brought her gifts. Mm. Like that was where her heart was in on Christmas Eve. Um, and so she really pled with the local priest director at age 15. Again, she... he, she <laughs> He said not until 21 to yeah. enter the convent. Um, so she asked the bishop who did not grant her request. And her father was by her side the whole time. He was like with yep. her in that. And then she then decided she would ask the Pope, yeah. which I just want to pause there because I so admire St. Therese in this in the way that she's like, go big or go home. You know, like she's a dreamer. Yeah. And I really appreciate that about her because I, I I relate in that. Like I have desires in my heart. And Jordan and I were talking about this and I know I'm already bringing in myself, my bad. But we were talking about how our Lord, <laughs> he gets excited. I think sometimes we forget that our God loves us a lot, like a lot, a lot. And he knows our heart. He knows our thoughts. He knows our, our words and what we do and every day. And so... <laughs> If we could just 
like imagine Abba Father, you know, in 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 heaven and on earth in, and in us, like longing to be with us. This is a childlike dependency and trust that St. Therese really, really had exuded and the way that she lived. And so she was like, you know what? If I can't do this, I'm going to go to the Pope and I'm going to ask him. And so she took a pilgrimage to Rome with her family. And Therese kind of had a cool dad, in my opinion. And when they visited the Colosseum, the two sisters ignored regulations prohibiting visitors, oops, from descending through the ruined structure to the arena floor. So she sneaked away from the tour group, climbed across the barriers and down the ruins to kneel and pray on the Colosseum floor. Gathering up a few stones as relics, they slipped back to the tour and no one except their father noted their absence. What? So Thieves. What? <laughs> So then she casually asked Pope Leo the Thirteenth, "Oh, Holy Father, if you say yes, everybody will agree." And he gazed at her, speaking these words, stressing each symbol syllable, "Go, go. You will enter if God wills it." Mm. And that gave her the confidence she needed, knowing, you know what? Okay, if God wills it, I will be in Carmel so at age fifteen. <laughs> let's just pause. Yes, pause. And understand the depth of that story, where she just casually goes up to the Pope at the time. And says, "Hey, can you make this happen for me, please?" Like, that's pretty astonishing. If you if you think about trying to do that now, we all know that there's no possible way that that's going to happen. She was a little stubborn. She was a little stubborn. In the best way. It's, it's it's pretty. It's just pretty amazing. Kind of an all in, all or nothing kind well, of. Well, she girl. wanted everything. She wanted everything, and, and she wanted she wanted everything rightly ordered. I think is safe to say because she wanted to become a nun. She wanted to serve and give herself in that way. So. Apparently, she was told, I forgot, I wrote this down. She was told that it was forbidden to speak to the Pope, as this would prolong the audience too much, which I get. I mean, the Pope's a really busy guy. Yeah. <laughs> so she turned toward her sister for advice. Speak, she said, her sister said. A moment later, she was at the Holy Father's feet, and she started crying and said, Most Holy Father, I have a great favor to ask you. Holy Father, in honor of your jubilee, permit me to enter Carmel at the age of 15. And that's that's the How, experience. That's the other thing. <laughs> How many people do you think, if you have an audience with the Pope, or even putting yourself in his shoes, if you can try to do that, and sit back and people are asking you for things all day long, assuming, right? Like, but it's probably prayer requests. It's probably all these different things. But to have this little girl come up and fall at your feet and cry and say, I want to give myself mm -hmm. fully to Christ. That's what she's saying. Mm -hmm. I want to become a nun in Carmel. And I, I that's all I want. That's so, I would think, so contrary to everything else that he probably has heard or experienced when people come up to him and ask him. It's pretty profound. Um, I don't know. I just as a that's totally conjecture. But well, so he said to ask her superiors, hmm. which I love that because the Pope was entrusting St. Therese to ask so superiors. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And Therese did not want to leave the Holy Father's presence. So the papal guards had to lift her up and carry the tearful young girl to the door. <laughs> relate. I relate. That's funny. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, so. So let, let's start talking about how she became a, or why she became a doctor of the church. We've, I think we've laid really good groundwork as to who she was, given a, giving an image or an idea of who she was, how she lived. So she goes into Carmel, right? She, she, yes. So she joined Pauline. All five of the girls became nuns at different times. Yeah. And she, she did end up going to Carmel and lived in a community. She lived in the cloister. And she was called Sister Tres of the Child Jesus in the Holy Face. I should have underlined yeah. that. And so Mother Superior gave her child Jesus name and she asked for Holy Face be because she loved the face of God and Jesus. And so she had a simple life of prayer and she wanted great intimacy with God. So, so yeah. So now let's talk about the meat, the meat of this. Okay, let's go. Why she became a doctor of the church. Let's talk about the little way. Let's talk about her humility. Let's talk about her suffering. <laughs> And the and I'm struck. I I'm really intrigued. This is one of those saints again that I didn't know too much about before we started studying. Um, funny enough, we did our first iteration of the show. We did a a, a show on her, but this, for whatever reason, this a long is, time ago. There was a long time when ago. We first started podcasting. This is all very new. Um, so this information is very new. I'm in the middle as we're recording this of a novena to Saint Therese with a friend of mine. And uh, I wish I could tell you the name of the book, but it's stunning. It gives you a reflection and talks about her writings and her life and all these different things. And Chris and I were talking about, I was showing it's her. It's not Story of a Soul. It's not Story of a Soul. Not her autobiography. Um, we were talking about this 
Oh, it's, I think it's called Joy and Suffering. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, Joy and Suffering According to St. Therese, the Child of Jesus. It is stunning to listen to her writings, this 24-year-old, and I guess even younger. Why, she's there's in no her telling. early 20s. Early 20s. She died when she was 24. In the depth of knowledge and wisdom she had, in the depth of her suffering... And we've talked about suffering a lot. We've talked about St. John on the cross. We've talked about carrying your cross. And that is all that St. Therese was about. Like she was all about little crosses. And it's so encouraging for me. And I think it should be for everybody because it's one thing. We 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 look up to the saints for different aspects. They And we've joked. They all kind of follow the same line. The narrow way is the same for everybody in a sense. We may take different paths on it, but it's it's still the narrow way to have An arduous journey to precisely, Jesus. Precisely, precisely. <laughs> to be like him. Mm-hmm. Always, is, It's always going to um, ha- happen with suffering. It's always going to happen with humility. It's always going to happen with these different things, right? All these are, are, are bound to happen on this journey. So it's really encouraging to hear from this young woman how she handled it and she suffered she really suffered mm-hmm. what tuberculosis right she did she get she did get she struggled long struggle with tuberculosis and i can't remember the time frame but i know that there's a lot of exhaustion a lot of stomach coughing, illness yeah coughing up blood yeah. you know like realizing she was pretty much under her death sentence with tuberculosis and so yeah. that actually caused her to have like a deep spiritual darkness yeah. Um, which is really hard for her. And I don't know if you remember this, y'all, but St. Teresa of Calcutta wanted to be St. Like she wanted her religious name to be St. Therese. But mm. another woman had already chosen that in the convent. And so she chose St. Teresa of Avila, like after St. Teresa. Avila. But anyway, yes. And her dad also had dementia. Mm. And this was really hard for her as well because she struggled with like r- letter writing um, to, to know how to take care of her father. It was really difficult um, for all of the sisters but yeah, so that's a whole nother story. And we, we might actually do an episode on her on her parents as well. But I'm sure we will. Yes, this little way, this little way, you guys, because we can do, we can experience suffering in a sacrificial, humble way, yeah. <laughs> which is easier said than done. But every single day we have the opportunity to <laughs> have an explosion of joy like St. Therese in this little way because she felt interiorly she felt a lot of of struggle she felt a lot of struggle but at the same time she offered up all those sufferings for our lord and so she didn't let it go to waste she said this she said on her deathbed i have reached the point of not being able to suffer anymore because all suffering is sweet to me say that again saintly (laughs) say it again i have reached the point of not being able to suffer anymore because all suffering is sweet to me all suffering is sweet to me. I can no longer suffer because the act of suffering has become sweet. Folks, that alone you could spend weeks meditating on. How is that possible that suffering, and for her, and we all suffer in different ways, for her as we laid out, coughing up blood, tuberculosis, stomach issues, bitter medicine. You know, th- there's a there's an interesting story that I was reading in here where um, she just accepted everything. And so the kitchen would recook food like 12 or um, reheat food like 12 times. And they said, well, Tres will eat it. Well, because she said, I will eat it. Yeah. With Without complaint. You know, y'all like, so I know we're being a little scattered today. So thank y'all for following us. There's been a lot of, <laughs> a lot leading up to today. But essentially she, there was a turning point in her life where she saw, she no longer saw suffering as suffering like in like pain wasn't it wasn't the point anymore like she knew that suffering was for for a purpose for our lord because christ suffered and to be like jesus and the child of jesus and the holy face she had to suffer inside herself and so okay so here's a quote she read um saint paul's great hymn to love in chapter 13 you know like um in the bible Love appeared to me to be the hinge for my vocation. I knew that the church had a heart and that such a heart appeared to be aflame with love. I saw and realized that love sets off the bounds of all vocations, that love is everything. Then nearly ecstatic with the supreme joy in my soul, I proclaimed, oh Jesus, my love, at last I have found my calling. My call is love. In the heart of the church, my mother, I will be love. 
and thus I will be all things as my de- as my desire finds its direction. And so Saint Therese loved with an unabandonment, like or an abandonment. I don't even know what word I'm trying to Complete say. Complete abandonment. Complete abandonment. No. Childlike love. Because she knew that God was the captain of her ship. In the ship that she was, <laughs> the ship of life, you know, y'all, like, she was suffering from tuberculosis. And back then, they didn't have a vaccine, I don't think, yet for her. So she was coughing up blood in her bed in Carmel, in the convent. And and on her deathbed, she's saying, like, my God, I love you. Those were her last words. And so actually, her sisters asked her to write. It's like a three-part I think it was her sisters and maybe Mother Superior. I'm not, I can't remember the exact story right now. But there's three parts of her autobiography that she wrote, I think. There's like three different drafts. Because they were asking her, like, can you write this down for us? Like her sisters were like, can you write your story down? Because we would love to have this. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that was 1897, the end of her life. And she said she would spend her, her heaven doing good on earth and that she would let drop a shower of roses upon those who prayed to her. And there are stories after stories so after stories, stories of people who prayed and who have received roses after roses. Yeah. 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 It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's really interesting. The little flower of Jesus. So you might be wondering why is St. Therese called the little flower of Jesus is because she was just like the simple wildflower. She felt like the wildflowers in the forests and fields unnoticed by the greater population yet growing and giving glory to God. Therese did not see herself as a brilliant rose or an elegant lily, but by simply being a small wildflower, she could serve our Lord. And I don't know about y'all. I keep hitting the microphone. Is that a problem? Oops, sorry, y'all. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I want to be a rose and I want everything. I'm like, God, I want this. I want that. I want this. And I ask, I'm asking my request or whatever. <laughs> And the Lord delights in that, right? Like he delights in us coming to him. Why do we pray, right? We're talking to God in conversation with him. He longs to hear from us. He's jealous for our time. He says that in scripture. And we can remember that when we present our request to the Lord, he will let us know if that's not what he wants. But it's okay to ask. It's okay to ask. And so St. Therese in her beautiful devotion, Eucharistic devotion. I mean, she called receiving the Eucharistic kiss of love. Mm. Um, So she was very devoted to Eucharistic meditation and adoration and going to mass. Um, She, in that struggle, in the story of a soul, she explains it better. And, And you might be wondering, men out there, like, how is this, how am I supposed to have a masculine devotion, you know, to this? flowery like well, simple little flower why don't, Jordan yeah, speak on why don't that. I speak on that so th- here's the reason there are you've you've probably heard me say about a billion and five times that we have to take up and carry our cross you've probably heard me say about a billion and twelve times that we have to suffer that's just part of our redemptive process in that you have to exercise humility in that suffering you have to exercise the fact that uh, number one I deserve far worse. Let's just be real. Mm. That's a baseline. I deserve worse. I'm a broken human being who sins all the time. I deserve hell. just We deserve judgment. hell. We do. We do. Just judgment, which is hell, right? How do you live in that way and still have faith and hope and charity? Well, you turn to Christ and say, I know that this is what I deserve, but I know that you want good for me. So I'm going to surrender everything to you. Therese did this beautifully in two ways. One, her entire surrender, her life, her commitment, right? In that suffering, whatever she experienced, she had the smile on her face, right? Despite whatever happened, she had a smile on her face. It doesn't matter. She had a smile. She could have been coughing up blood. She's going to smile. And and that sounds extreme, but it's true. I mean, every picture you see of her, she's smiling and she's known for that smile. The second way is that every action that you take, you are doing in a way to serve God, whether serving others, you know, for God or serving God himself. She's she's the saint who wrote, you can find God in the pots and pans, 
right? Talking about these little things that we can do. She also wrote somewhere, I was trying to find it a second ago, I couldn't find it, but you you have the opportunity to pick up a pin. I know I, sa- I have a funny accent, so I'm saying P-I-N, like a, <laughs> a, a sewing pin. Um, pick that up. That could be an opportunity to serve God. As a man, men are people of action. We should be. As a man, you should be a person of action. I'm getting amped up at the moment. There you go. There you go. Everything that you do needs to be rightly ordered. Every single step that you take should be rightly ordered in in service to your calling, in service to the one who called you. Servium, I will serve, St. Michael. Very appropriate for the day that we're recording. This is important. You can look to St. Therese because she exuded this in, in such a profound way, in a clear way. Sometimes we look at these saints and we see how they suffered and it's hard to wrap our hands, heads around. She has a beautiful way of writing and explaining that makes it incredibly clear. And, and very I, relatable. And very relatable. And Ordinary. I highly recommend uh, looking up either this novena, this uh, the joy and suffering paradox, um, as well as a story of the soul, which I'm going to be purchasing and reading myself. But that's how, men, are you listening? If you didn't go back, what was that producer like about a minute? You can rewind. I know there's like a 30 second reverse button. Hit it a couple times and listen again. It's really important. It's truly, really important because we have to die to ourselves. We always have to die to ourselves. And how did she do that, Jordan? Remember in Carmel, in the convent, there were sisters that she didn't particularly like. No. And so there was actually, my husband was telling me this morning, there was a sister that was a little bit you know, annoying or something to St. Therese. And yet she thought, that sister thought she was her best friend. Yeah. And later wrote because, to her. Because Therese chose. Chose to love her yes. in those moments of difficulty when it was hard to smile. Because that's choosing to die to self. That's that's sacrificial love, right? That is sacrificial love. Is when it's not about me, narcissistic me, you know, no. selfish me. It's about you mm-hmm. or you or whomever we're in front of. Every single day, God places people and situations, challenges, struggles, you know, little hurdles in our way so that we can grow in virtue and yeah. love. That's yeah. the point of it all, right? There's, and I love she exudes this. So she writes, there are trifles which please our Lord more than the conquest of the world. A smile or a kindly word, for instance, when I feel inclined to say nothing or to appear bored. There's so much in that short little quote. She's saying these things that we see as trifles. She uses that word for a reason. These small things that we would, that's just a trifle. Like we don't, we don't need, no. These small things please our Lord more than the conquest of the world. Mm, These small actions. Like we said, she wanted to be a missionary. She wanted to be a priest, but guess what? She couldn't. Joan of Arc. Yeah. Uh, So, so again, a smile or a kindly word when I feel inclined to say nothing or to appear bored. What is that? That's denial of self. I don't feel inclined to say anything. I don't want to give you a smile. I may be tired. I may be going through a lot, but I'm stepping outside of myself and I'm giving this because that's what I'm called to do. I think a lot of the time, I, I'm always fascinated with the suffering because I think a lot of the time we have this woe is me, you know, thing. And there Complain are... Complain mentality. Yeah, and, and it's... I think emotionally it's healthy to recognize when we're going through something that is incredibly hard or we're suffering. Like there's, there's no good in denying your yourself that you're suffering, but there's a difference between, you know, the way what's, I, Oh, I wish I could remember the gnashing of teeth. No, there's, there's a, like you're not wailing and there's a particular Bible verse that I, I'm, I always, I do this a lot. I always forget the Bible verse, But the person who's like, oh, woe is me. And then the person who's quietly just like putting ashes on their forehead. There's a big difference there, right? And where do we find our comfort and solace? I don't know. You tell me. I don't know. I don't have the answers. Oh, you know, the (laughs) Abba Father, our Holy Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that comforts us. He is the one that knows us best. And so it's this quiet acts of love that she really lived out. And that's where we gain our life by losing it. Yeah. And the elevator story. I do want to share the elevator share story. The elevator okay. Story. So St. Therese said, I wanted to find an elevator which would raise me to Jesus for I am too small to climb the rough stairway of perfection. Girl, I feel you. But I searched then in the scriptures for some sign of this elevator, the object of my desires. And I read these words coming from the mouth of eternal wisdom. Whoever is a little one, let him come to me. The elevator, which must 
raise me to heaven in your is your arms, O oh Jesus. And for this, I have no need to grow up, but rather I have to remain little and become this more and more. Hmm. She really recognized that it is through God alone that we will be satisfied and that we can reach eternity yeah. through him. And she could do this with childlike surrender and trust that Jesus said this to his disciples. They're like, God, how do we get to heaven? You know, how do we do it? How do we have eternal salvation? They're like, he he was sitting with the kids and was like, come to me, all you who are, well, weary, but the little ones, the little ones. And so I don't know about you, Jordan. What were your first words? Do you remember your what? first words? How would like, I remember my first kid? words? Well, did you, did you ask your parents? Did <laughs> no, you ask your dad? Ask okay. Well, That's I asked a question my mom. I was clearly not expecting. <laughs> I just threw them off. Sorry, y'all. I asked my mom what my first words were when I was a kid. You said, ask your dad, ask your dad. My first words were up here, like quite uh, literally up here. And it was because I was putting my hands up in the air and asking my mom and dad to pick me up. It was up here, up here. She said I would like grasp up here, up That's here. That's funny. Anyway, and I just see like St. Therese is this child, you know, and she was in her 20s, but so modest, so fierce so docile like she had all of these virtues at such a young age because like i said i think her parents really set her up for success on that but also she really was dependent on our lord for everything all her needs and she realized it she was completely surrendered to god okay so she's human right and she still had her her weaknesses and she well, she suffered yeah. whatever but anyway i wanted to share that elevator story because jesus <laughs> really loves us a lot and, where, and she recognized that climb is and hard. she she recognized it because everything she did was based in the explosion of love within her so i i, I think we should end it probably on this quote oh we have to end it that's a bummer love appeared to me <laughs> to be the hinge for my vocation i knew that the church had a heart and that such a heart appeared to be a flame with love i saw and realized that love sets off the bounds of all vocations that love is everything that nearly ecstatic with the supreme joy in my soul i proclaimed oh jesus my love at last i have found my calling my call is love in the heart of the church my mother i will be love and thus i will be all things as my desire finds its direction those last four words my de desire finds its direction five if you want to include my as I about did. My desire finds its direction. I really want to push people or recommend to meditate on that. Where is your desire and where is it directed? Where is it rooted? Where is God calling you? St. Therese figured that out. Everything and, is grace. Was and, kind of like her little theme. And that's why she's song. a saint and a doctor of the church. At age 24. 24. 1897 she died. Amazing. Ordinary things with extraordinary love. No. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, St. <laughs> Therese, I can never say this right. St. Therese of Lisieux. That French Saint word. St. Therese of the Child Jesus in the Holy Face. St. Therese, <laughs> pray for us. <laughs> Bye. Bye. How can we end it? How can we end it?